All right, guys. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the second day. Listen, if anyone's missing their coat from last night, I still think there are some at the banqueting house. I think, I think some people left in disgust at the line length of the queue. I know I almost did, so apologies for that. We tried to get you all out before 10, but then God, our coats got screwed up. Um, anyway, despite the problem with coats, hope you enjoyed the evening. Uh, the coverage of the first day of the conference has been very good. There's an excellent piece on BBC Online, if you want to look at that. And then there's been coverage in the Times, Telegraph, and Mail. Also, uh, interestingly, last night, on the first evening of his trip to India yesterday, David Cameron said that he absolutely agreed with John Major's comments and criticised the social makeup of politics, the media, armed forces, and judiciary. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, Lee? <laughs> That's kind of what we've been doing a long time. Anyway, maybe he's been looking at some of our data. So we'll be looking to work with David Cameron to try and do something about this. Uh, now, we have a full morning ahead of us with, with again, some great speakers. Later this morning, we'll be hearing from uh, David Willits, who is, as you know, Minister for Universities and Science, and then uh, from our rapporteur, John O'Leary. John's normally sitting there. We're, oh, he's there. Oh, there's John. <laughs> Busily scribing away. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Mary Kernock Cook, who is the Chief Executive of UCAS, which is the UK's university college and admission system. Something you need in America. Someone try and coordinate all this stuff. Uh, well, well, we know getting our kids to apply is a huge amount of work because there's nothing. You, everyone's having a different stuff. Anyway, you can talk about that. At UCAS, Mary has not been afraid to court contra controversy. Most recently, she expressed concerns about the disparities between teachers' predictions of A-levels and A-levels actually achieved. Mary's kindly agreed to take questions after she's spoken and then to join the panel on what are universities selecting for. So over to you, Mary. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Peter, um, and uh, thank you for including me in this uh, fantastic summit and indeed the dinner last night, which uh, even the queue for the coats didn't uh, <laughs> diminish my enjoyment of the, of the evening. It was uh, really spectacular. Um, so what I want to do this morning is kind of just do a bit of a roundup of some of the uh, widening participation and fair access indicators that we can see through uh, the UCAS data. Um, and a, a couple of things just to put in your mind as I go through the presentation. I think there's, there's two key things that we look at. One is the application rate, um, and that for me is about demand for higher education, because you can't get in if you don't apply in the first place. And so the application rates, are, I think, are broadly um, the kind of indicators that we want to look at uh, for widening participation. And then the acceptance rate, which is the proportion of all those who apply who either accept or get accepted. It's usually both, both the student and uh, the institution that have to uh, do that acceptance. And that's probably more in the kind of fair, uh, fair access, uh, fair admissions territory. Um, but those are two important distinctions. Um, now, obviously, with the big increase in tuition fees in 2012, uh, I think everybody expected that uh, there would be a, a big dent in the UK's appetite uh, for higher education um, uh, as a result. And uh, just for context, um, here is uh, the national picture. So this is the English 18-year-old application rate. It's a 10-year picture and as you can see the evidence is uh, that the application rate, the demand for HE has been uh, rising and it's pretty much continued on trend. You can see those two little bits of turbulence around 2005-06 when the fees went up first and then again a very similar little blip there um, around 11-12. Um, so that's the national picture. Um, now I think there's a lot of um, 
public narrative about whether participation has been widening. I've heard even people saying that it's got worse since, uh, you know, since the Robbins report. Um, and I think it's worth um, looking at some of the key indicators. Um, so here, um, and we've kind of looked at just about every possible angle uh, in the UCAS data. And here are sort of three measures. So the first one is the ratio um, of uh, um, participation in high, high, uh, higher education between the most advantaged um, part of... The, this is using English 18-year-olds purely because that's the biggest uh, group of people in our data. Um, so it's a quite a pure sort of statistical analysis point. Um, and as you can see, um, that ratio has uh, been improving. There's still a big gap. Uh, the better off are still nearly three times as likely to enter higher education um, as uh, the most disadvantaged. Um, the second line um, looks at uh, the entry rates for higher tariffs. So that's, that's, our, that's our language for selective, um, probably mostly Russell Group type institutions. And there again, you can see a much bigger gap. Um, so nearly seven and a half times uh, greater um, entry rate to higher tariff institutions from the most advantaged to, uh, compared to the most disadvantaged. But again, uh, an improving picture. And just recently, we've been able to get some uh, reliable data um, about those who have free school meal uh, backgrounds. Um, and even that measure is also showing some improvement over that uh, three-year period. Um, so I know there's a lot of interest in access to higher tariff, more selective um, institutions. You know, the, the idea of social mobility being about getting bright kids from deprived backgrounds uh, into the most selective universities. So I've got a few things, a few slides just to have a look at that. So if we look at the higher tariff um, institutions, um, and this shows uh, quite a big disparity. So this looks at the proportion of applicants from those different school types making at least one choice uh, to a higher tariff institution. And you can see quite clearly here the, the purple line at the top, 85% of those applying uh, from independent schools making at least one choice uh, to those. And the yellow line, which is, if you like, the kind of non-selective state sector, much lower, only 48% of those uh, making a choice to at least one higher tariff uh, institution. But the acceptance rate is still much lower uh, from those who do apply to higher tariff institutions from uh, state schools. So you can see here only 42% uh, from non-selective state schools uh, who did make a choice to a higher tariff institution are actually accepted compared to nearly 70% uh, from the independent schools. And so I think it's worth having a think about what the reasons behind uh, this might be. Um, and there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a pretty solid narrative about levels of achievement. So this chart um, shows the tariff, so the UCAS tariff, which is a sort of broad uh, measure of uh, the grades achieved uh, by our applicants. Um, and here you can see a clear difference in the distribution of the grade scores between the selective schools, which is more to the right of the, uh, of the diagram, the higher tariff scores, um, and uh, those from the non-selective, which is the yellow line, uh, more to the left, uh, lower tariff. And when you look at that a wee bit closer, so this is a, an over time uh, gap between tariff achievement between selective and non-selective schools. So you can see that uh, in both cases, grade achievement has uh, been rising, although beginning to flatten out uh, with the uh, comparability measures from um, Ofqual and so on. Um, but uh, the gap here is, uh, is approximately uh, equivalent to three whole A-level grades lower uh, for the non-selective state sector overall. Uh, the other thing that it's really important to look at, and it's not just what grades people get, but it's also whether they're getting the grades in the right subjects to progress uh, to the courses that they want. Um, so this one looks at uh, the Russell Group facilitating subjects. Um, and this is the proportion of young applicants who've, who've got three A-levels and looking at how many of them have at least two facilitating subjects. 
which is kind of the indicator um, in the Russell Group's uh, informed choices document um, about the sort of uh, the best chances of getting into those uh, those courses. Um, and you can see here very very clearly that. Um, uh, A-level subjects in non-selective state schools, only 53% of them holding two or more of the Russell Group facilitating subjects uh, compared to over 72% uh, for the independent schools. I was, uh, on, on Tuesday this week, I, I did a couple of assemblies for a, a big comprehensive school uh, in West London talking about why I go to university and all that stuff. And afterwards, I did a, a bit of a focus group with some of the year 13s who've applied. And, you know, I talked to an absolutely delightful young man, predicted A stars in his three A levels, got an application in uh, to Cambridge. Uh, and I'm not going to say the subjects because it might I identify uh, the individual. But when I asked him what subjects he was doing, uh, I could only conclude that he was either somebody who'd had very, very poor advice about what might be a platform for progression to uh, a very selective or even Oxford or Cambridge, um, or he'd had a kind of late uh, change of mind about what his uh, aspirations would be. And either of those scenarios is, is not, uh, not ideal. Now, there's another really important dimension, which I think is um, not considered often enough as a widening participation issue. Um, and this is the very worrying differences between application rates uh, for men and for women. Uh, women are a third more likely to apply for higher education. In fact, our end of cycle report last year showed that we've got to the stage now where more women are entering higher education than men are applying. And the gap is getting wider. So I talked earlier about how the gap between uh, rich and poor was improving, uh, for a large gap that's improving. Um, and here I've put them on the same, uh, the same chart. Let's see if I can point this out using the... So these two lines are the difference between uh, men and women. Men there, women there. You can see that gap getting bigger. And here we are, uh, the most advantaged group and the least advantaged group. Uh, now, I've done a slightly naughty thing to, uh, to make uh, my point, um, but I think it does make it um, uh, quite strongly. If you extrapolate those trends, um, here is what happens. And you can see how worried we should be about the difference uh, in uh, progression to higher education between men and women, because if you extrapolate those trends for 10 years, if we don't do anything about it, in 10 years' time, this conference uh, will need to consider more about the difference, differences between men and women uh, than it will do uh, to look at socioeconomic uh, background. Um, and I continue to think that that's not an issue that's getting enough airtime uh, in the sort of uh, uh, policy debate um, and is a really important factor to um, keep an eye on. Um, we've also, uh, quite recently, again, we've been able to do some good analysis um, from... Uh, about ethnic background. And, and this chart, for me, uh, reminds us that we really need to keep an eye on what's happening because things do change. So you can see on this chart, back in 2000 and 2006, the uh, black ethnic group was the lowest uh, participation, the lowest demand for HE was from the black group. Over the period to this year, they've been the fastest growing group, and right now it's the whites group which is, has the lowest uh, demand uh, application rates uh, for higher education. Um, so really important to look at those. I think it's quite interesting to see you know, who's at the top, the Chinese um, and uh, Asian background groups, you know, uh, way, way ahead. Those are, are smaller groups, um, but I guess... Uh, most of us might not be surprised um, at that. Now, just uh, looking um, at the factors uh, affecting demand from different socioeconomic groups. So, so this is a, um, a picture over, over about 10 years. Uh, quintile 5, that's the most advantaged group, the blue line, and the red line is quintile 1, the most uh, disadvantaged group. And uh, what you see here uh, is that the most advantage group, the blue line, that's been pretty much flat 
in terms of demand for HE for application rates over a 10-year period. And it's actually uh, the growth in higher education has mostly come um, from the lower, uh, the more disadvantaged groups. Um, and that growth is quite spectacular, from about 11% back in 2004 to nearly 20% uh, application rate uh, in uh, 2013. Now, again, this is, a, this is a, um, a slight indulgence of mine, but here is a very strikingly similar chart um, over the same period that looks at participation in different types of qualifications. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very similar, it's almost exactly the same chart, isn't it? And I don't think it's a coincidence um, that uh, those, uh, the, the chart about uh, socioeconomic background matches very closely uh, with that sort of flat uh, proportion of young people uh, who are holding A-levels um, and the very sharp growth uh, in the number of young people who are holding uh, vocational qualifications. It's actually the, the vocational qualifications has grown by five times um, over that period. Now, the reason this is important is because what's happening in secondary education creates, if you like, the main pipeline uh, that we in higher education need to consider when we're looking um, at participation <coughs> and access issues. And this is a quote from the Department for Education consultation on vocational qualifications, um, and they give this really uh, worrying quote. The proportion of students entered for purely academic qualifications, so that's mainly A-levels, has been in steady decline, and it's declined from 70% in 2008 to just over 50% in 2012. Just four years. You know, that is a huge uh, shift. Um, and I think uh, partly... Uh, driven by key stage four accountability measures, which, uh, which are changing. I might say a bit more um, about that later. So if we look at the entry rate for 18-year-olds uh, holding A-levels, um, and again, I've split this um, by uh, the uh, quintiles of, um, of deprivation, that the, the measure that we use. So uh, the red line is the most deprived group, and the blue line at the top is the most affluent group. And you can see that there are broadly flat entry rates across um, those different groups over that uh, period of, it uh, looks like, six years on, on that chart. Um, and you can see also the big difference, so 40% roughly entry rate from the most advantage, only 10% entry rate uh, from the most disadvantage. And uh, just, to, just as a way of thinking about this chart, if A-levels were the only route to higher education, this would be... Uh, the picture, the n this would give you the national picture of inequality uh, between uh, the different groups. So we can look at this in terms of um, uh, accepted applicants who are accepted um, uh, to higher education and splitting it between high, medium and low tariff institutions. So you can see from this chart, A-levels are still by far and away the, the predominant qualification for progression uh, to higher education, especially for higher tariff um, institutions, that, uh, that top line there. Um, but look at the very significant decline in the numbers entering the medium and lower tariff institutions uh, with A-levels. <coughs> so if they're not taking A-levels, uh, what are they taking? And the answer is, um, as you might guess, it's vocational qualifications. And I'm going to talk mostly about BTECs, um, because BTECs are by far the, the next biggest qualification that we see um, in the UCAS data um, and gives us a big enough base uh, to make those measurements. So here is the picture, again split by uh, the different groups uh, for those, um, uh, the entry rate for those holding BTECs. And so uh, by contrast, uh, you know, if BTECs were the only way of getting into uh, higher education, uh, what you see on this chart would, would actually say that we probably don't even need a, a conference um, like this. Now, uh, you know that in the last uh, two years, there's been a change in the way that um, uh, numbers are controlled in higher education with uh, exemptions from number controls for those who hold higher grade uh, qualifications. And uh, in the 2013 cycle, 
it was grades A, B, B and better, um, and that counted for uh, equivalent. So those are A, B, B grades at A level or the equivalent grades uh, for um, B techs. Um, so have a look uh, at this chart, which looks at the proportion of those holding these higher grade uh, qualifications, uh, split by uh, the most advantaged um, and the least advantaged. I'm sorry, for some reason, one of the lines has changed color without, uh, without my express permission there. Um, but I think you get, uh, you get the picture. So on the left, uh, the least advantaged groups, a steep decline in achievement of this ABB threshold uh, from A levels and a very steep growth uh, in those achieving the ABB threshold uh, from BTEX. And then just look at the contrast uh, with the picture from the most advantaged uh, groups uh, on the right of this uh, picture. Another way um, of looking at that is that people from different backgrounds are making different choices about uh, their qualifications. Um, in some cases, I think the schools might be making uh, those different choices about qualifications um, rather than the pupils. But what you can see here, the independent schools, that little green line lurking right on the bottom of the scale, um, those who are probably best informed uh, about higher education and, and uh, how to be successful in applying for higher education are pretty much avoiding BTEX um, altogether. While the most disadvantaged, quintile one, um, who are by contrast, the least familiar with uh, the routes for applying successfully to higher education um, have this very sharp growth from 60% uh, to over 80% in, in just five years. Um, and incidentally, that's as a proportion of those holding A levels. So here's another way of looking at it. So um, this shows you that in quintile one, the most disadvantaged group, for every 100 people, um, uh, uh, holding A levels, there were 77 who held uh, BTEX, um, and then in the most advantaged group, quintile five, uh, for every hundred people holding A levels, there were just nine uh, holding uh, BTEX. Now, why uh, why does this matter if these qualifications are so-called um, equivalent? This chart shows uh, the entry rate to higher tariff institutions. <coughs> Uh, with A levels at the top, the top orange line, um, and uh, the bottom yellow line or pale orange line uh, is the entry rate with BTEX. But the simple fact is that the higher tariff institutions want to recruit people with academic qualifications, A levels, uh, and similar. And you know, if they're looking, as they're required to through their access agreements and so on, to recruit more bright kids from uh, more deprived background. What this picture tells you is, and, and incidentally, don't forget we've got declining 18-year-old populations overall. So that the challenge is that they've got a declining population and a smaller <coughs> proportion of those are gaining the A-levels that they need to support uh, progression to a higher tariff um, institution which to me makes widening participation for the most selective groups uh, very much of an uphill struggle. We've really only just started to uh, look at this big shift from uh, A-levels to vocational qualifications, particularly BTEX. We've only just started to look at this quite recently. Um, and there are another a number of other um, features that we uh, are starting to understand. So here you can see that the proportion um, of... Uh, university accepts from people holding BTEX um, is, is very strong in the slightly older age groups. So that, uh, that blue line at the top is the 20 to 24 year olds. So another feature of this is that those holding BTEX don't have that same kind of linear progression to higher education that you get with A-levels. So A-levels at 18, progress to university at 18 or 19, that's the kind of norm uh, with BTEX, it's a, it's a much more uh, bumpy picture and quite a large proportion um, of those holding BTEX will be going into the workplace uh, for a year or two um, before they think about applying to higher education. And incidentally, uh, we see about 100,000 um, applicants with BTEX in the UCAS data, um, but uh, the Pearson data, so BTEC is a Pearson qualification, 
um, shows that there are over 200,000 uh, learners uh, using BTEX at, uh, at level three. So uh, there are lower progression rates um, overall. Uh, we've also had a look at, uh, at uh, geography to see if there's any, um, anything interesting to look at there. Um, and the patterns are not uniform across the country. So this map shows a, a pretty stark sort of north-south uh, divide with much higher entry into higher education um, uh, with BTEX from the north of the country uh, compared to uh, the south. You might think that's just a reflection of, um, of the economics, the north-south divide economically, but when you actually uh, map that just for the most deprived groups, you get a slightly different uh, picture there as well. So I think in all of this, I, by the way, I don't have any answers to why these, uh, why these patterns. We're only, as I said, just starting to look at it in detail because it seems to be such an important uh, trend. Um, but uh, UCAS is starting to do much more um, analysis of all of this so that we can get a, um, a better picture. The other thing about BTEX, of course, is that um, they're different kind of subjects uh, to A-levels, and they're, on the whole, bigger qualifications. So these are the biggest BTEC uh, subjects, and this chart just breaks down. So the little dark red bit at the end of those bar charts um, uh, shows you um, uh, how many of uh, those applicants uh, have been accepted to higher tariff institutions taking those subjects. And just to put it into context, you know, if you've done a BTEC in, um, let's say, uh, performing arts, the likelihood is that you're going to progress to a, a university course in performing arts or something very similar. Whereas if you've done three A-levels, a portfolio of three A-level subjects, you literally have tens of thousands of different courses uh, and different institutions that, uh, that you can apply for. So I think it's also important to understand that that these vocational qualifications tend to give a narrower uh, progression opportunity uh, to young people. And they're probably having to follow decisions that they made at probably age 13 or 14, the kind of decisions they made even uh, in their key stage four qualifications um, are putting them on a very uh, specific route into higher education. Um, don't worry, uh, I've just yeah. about finished. Well, yeah. I'm just concluding, is that all right? Two well, seconds? We some questions as well. Yeah, Sorry. so here we are. <laughs> Here are my uh, conclusions. Um, so uh, first of all, um, uh, access to higher education is uh, improving, but there are still very wide uh, disparities, and we mustn't congratulate ourselves too early on that. Uh, I continue to be very, very worried about the gap between uh, men and women, and that gap is getting wider. Um, it's quite clear that achievement levels and choice of subjects and choice of qualifications are still disadvantaging um, those from uh, the uh, non-selective state sector. And then finally, um, the growth in vocational qualifications, particularly BTEX, is highest uh, in uh, disadvantaged groups. There are lower progression rates from vocational qualifications overall. BTEX offer narrower choice of HE courses and institutions. Um, and my final point, really, um, is just to mention this in the context of A-level uh, reform, where the narrative is about tougher, more rigorous uh, A-levels. Um, and I just have to point out that if the narrative is that they're getting tougher and more rigorous, that's likely to increase the migration to vocational qualifications. Um, and the school that I visited in, in uh, West London earlier this week, I heard it from the horse's mouth big comprehensive school, about two-thirds of their sixth form going on to higher education, including lots to uh, uh, more selective institutions, big curriculum of A-levels, and they offer three BTEC subjects. And kind of before I could even ask a question, he said, but we're just about to increase our BTEC offer uh, because we're worried uh, that more kids um, will want to take that as a safer route uh, to uh, getting their qualifications. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry if I went on. <laughs> Mary, I, I'm, as, as chair, I'm going to ask you the first question, if I may, which is, we all know the disparities between what teachers predict K-12 
kids are going to get at a level and what they get. I mean, most of the time they're wrong. And, and decisions to offer kids places at, at, at universities are based on predictions. Um, can you tell us why the sector is so resistant to going to what we call a system where you would make people would choose universities and be selected on their actual grades, so-called so -called PQA, post-qualifications admission system. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to comment on that. Um, right. And I think the first thing I'd say is that we already have a post-qualification system, um, and it's called clearing. I think one of the features of the 2013 clearing round was that it did feel much more like a late application <coughs> route because institutions of all different types, including the most selective um, and uh, the recruiting institutions, uh, ha had places available um, after A-level results. And it became a genuine route for people to uh, maybe change their minds from an earlier application, people who come direct into clearing. Um, and uh, so I'm very keen to, uh, you know, trying to change the whole system to post-qualifications um, and we looked at this in a huge amount of detail about 18 months ago, um, the, the logistics of it, even from the secondary sector, who on the whole thought they were very pro that, yeah. uh, that option, when they looked at what would actually be involved in trying to advise um, you know, 300,000 kids who are waiting for their A-level results, advise them in that very short window afterwards uh, what applications to make, even they said it's not practical. So I'm very keen to have this sort of dual route so that people can apply early. Those institutions that need to do extensive interviewing or additional tests and so on have got the time to do that really detailed selection, um, uh, but that also we build up what's currently known as clearing as a genuine late application route uh, that people can uh, find a whole variety of courses um, if they want to wait till they've got their, uh, their results and not have to wait a whole extra year. I'll, we'll talk about that afterwards. I'm not going to oh, comment. Okay. I'm not going to comment on that. The, uh, I think we'll take three questions. Is that all right? Yep, that's Mary, fine. Because uh, you're going to be part of the panel anyway, so then we can people can ask you questions after that. So why don't we get three questions for Mary and then hello. Yeah, can you say again who you are and where you're from and Thank you. yeah. I'm Becky Francis, King's College London. Right. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated, Mary. What what a stimulating talk and brilliant data. Um, the BTEC issue, which was really central there, um, absolutely get your argument about the narrow focus, but we might see it le as legitimate, mightn't we, if they're de doing um, a BTEC in, say, engineering, and, and, and then they expect to get a route through to Imperial College to do engineering or, or some such. But clearly, from your presentation, the leading universities aren't accepting them anyway. So that comes back um, really to the university admissions themselves, doesn't it? What is the basis for that rejection? Do we have evidence that BTECs are actually less rigorous? I'm very interested in this issue about rigor and some of the assumptions that seem to underlie the facilitating subjects for the Russell Group, um, but that uh, seem to be actually based on sometimes quite random decision-making there by the Russell Group. So perhaps, um, you know, an evidence about rigor, rigor and, and whether right. there is any. Yeah. <coughs> Another question? Uh, yeah, over there. Yeah. Hello, Anna Zimdat, um, also King's College London. Um, supporting professionalism in admissions has recently published a report on the evidence base for contextual data in admissions. And the report highlighted um, HEI's need for better linked individual level data to evaluate, in particular, some of their outreach and widening participation <laughs> work. Will UCAS work with the sector in? Um, providing this uh, data and developing that evidence base. Okay, okay. And back there, yeah. Um, thank you, Penny Egan, um, Fulbright Commission. Um, we can see from our data that uh, the number of women applying for Fulbright awards seeds men by roughly the same kind of percentage that you've been showing. But I'm just wondering, is this a worldwide phenomenon? Is it just a developing world? Is it just US, UK? Okay. <coughs> Over to you. Yeah, you, yeah. 
Um, so they all look like they're answerable, so I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah you don't have to dodge well, anyone. Well, yeah. um, so on the um, <laughs> on the BTEC and the preference um, of more selective institutions for academic qualifications, um, you know that that's probably for some of our admissions um, practitioners uh, to answer that. And to a certain extent, they've got used to people uh, with A levels. But the fact is that the BTEC is a very different type of qualification. Um, all uh, the assessment currently is internal, so there are no external exams, um, although I think that is um, changing shortly. Um, uh, they're, they're highly modular, so they're even smaller modules than, um, than the current modular um, A-levels. <coughs> and there's, uh, there's, there's no requirement for extended uh, writing um, in the assessment and the, and the curriculum for BTECs. Um, so uh, I'm not saying that they're any better or worse than A-levels. Um, anecdotally, I think a lot of people say that um, those with BTECs you know, will struggle on more academic courses, probably for those reasons. I've also talked to some universities who say you know, they can see this trend happening and they're actually changing how they do induction of students, um, how they treat students who come from different routes who will need different help and support um, to get them up to a, a, an equal level. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, either selective institutions need to understand BTECs more, have more influence on the reform generally of vocational qualifications, as they never hit the headlines. Um, uh, you know, the, anyway, anyone would think that it's still only GCSEs and A levels out there where, you know, that just simply isn't true anymore. Um, uh, so, I think the, the sector perhaps needs to. Um, be, have a, a stronger voice in uh, how uh, vocational qualifications are changed. Um, on the contextual data point, um, UCAS already does um, uh, not not perfect, but we've I think we've made some quite big steps in terms of um, flagging contextual indicators um, in the application forms. My own view is uh, that the biggest change that we could make um, is to have a universal adoption of this unique learner number, um, because that, that would actually allow us as well to track some of the outreach and access activities right through, you know, from universities going out into to schools and colleges um, and actually being able to track through the unique learner number whether that's made a difference to application and, um, and acceptance rates. Um, <clears throat> it's very difficult for us um, to get reliable uh, contextual data without something which makes it quite clear that we're, where we're drawing data from different sources that we are applying it to um, the same person. Um, and the question about the gap between men and women um, and international, I think that might be better um, uh, addressed when, we, when we've Go got on experts on the panel. Okay. I'm afraid I don't right. know the answer. Okay. Mary, thank you very much. I'm just, as vocationals come up, I'm just going to make a comment about this. We had the Boston Consulting Group look at what is the offering for kids in this country that don't go to university? I won't go into details. Mm. The bottom line is it's terrible, okay? So then we said, well, look around the world. Who does it right? And they came back and said the <coughs> Germanic countries. I lived in Germany for two years. Own businesses there. know extremely well. So the way it works in Germany is every kid who leaves school does an academic qualification at school and then either goes to university, which is a pretty much a minority, or joins an organization and becomes an apprentice. That could be a baker, it could be a banker, it's the whole range. And what they do is they get paid, they go on day release, so they, they call it the dual system. You, you work and study. But the important thing, an organisation has to take you on. So you don't have FE colleges producing five times as many hairdressers as there are jobs, which we do here. So supply and demand is regulated, and kids come out with trained for work and with a job, because the organisation... And it seems to me kids in this country are between a rock and a hard place. They know, I've got to go to university to get a decent job, but I'm going to come out with £50,000 worth, call it debt, whatever, we can debate that. Uh, so I really think we have to get our act together in this country in terms of, and we shouldn't be teaching kids at 13 vocational qualifications. That they should be, I think, in organisations, learning proper jobs and coming out as, you know, terrific employees. Anyway. Lee, you're, you're next. Thank you, Mary. Let's give Mary a big hand. <laughs>